Welcome to the 7th Amazing Race Canada recap episode of the UR Team Number podcast from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who performs flips while wearing bubble wrap, Logan Saunders. Morning. Good morning. And what a ridiculous episode this was. This is when casting carries the weight for the show. <laughs> yeah. This was a textbook, tasks we would bitch about episode, but the cast really delivered this week. Oh yes, they did. We even saw a bit about Rita and Yvette for once. Yeah, and they did extraordinarily well. So yeah, previously six teams raced to Volda Mussoliniville, Ontario. At the roadblock, Frankie and Amy shocked everyone by using the express pass that Steph and Kristen had secretly given them in a very public place in Vietnam. Uh, Kristen and Ashley made a U-turn deal, thanks to Joel and Ashley's knowledge of where the express pass was from. At the detour, Frankie and Amy burned their chances at first place while Joel and Ashley painted themselves into a corner and into last place, but just like the other teams, they were told to keep on racing. What I pretty much wrote down in the previously on segment notes was express pass, express pass, express pass, express pass. I've noticed that compared to Phil, Monty's previously on segments tend to be weirdly worded. It tends to be odd sentences that just don't run into each other. And it's something quite nitpicky, I know, because, you know, it's basically me adapting them for our previously on segments. But Monty's ones tend to be a little bit odd. He tends to, like, start a sentence, then make it only one phrase, and then go on to the next one. Yeah, I noticed that too. Where there's, where there's an ellipses and you expect more, but then there isn't. So, as we found out at the end of the last episode, teams must now take a train to Toronto and then connect to another one to Kingston, Ontario. Once there, they have to, obviously, because it's Canada, find a maple syrup stand at Springer Market Square to get their next clue. And they have $580 for this leg of the race. So, Kingston is very expensive to travel through, even though it's a self-drive leg. I'm assuming that was mainly for the trains, but I don't know for certain. Those, those are pricey trains, then. Yeah, the, the trains really weren't that expensive when I did the Canadian trains, because I... I have done one from Union Station, and I don't remember it being expensive. It wasn't $580 to get from Union Station to Vancouver? It probably is about that, but we did Toronto to Niagara Falls on go, and yeah, it really wasn't that expensive. It was only about 10 quid, I think, or about $15. Hmm. So who knows? It would be a bit extreme if it was just from Toronto to uh, Kingston was 580 <laughs> Yeah. They are very generous with the money on Amazing Race Canada, I've noticed this. They really don't want anyone begging. Begging. Didn't, what was the total last year? Like $6,000 they got for the season? Eight, I think it was. $8,000? It was something like $8,000. And just think with this season, they're the two international countries are like the two cheapest countries to travel to in the world. But the best thing is, they should give them US dollars next week, just to make it really hard for them. <laughs> you, you're right. Even with the embargo, yeah, I don't think Cuba will be, there's going to be too much American money there. You have ten Cuban cigars for this leg of the race. Now that, it would be worth something. I guess not so much to the locals. It'd be the equivalent to bits of string. You have four packs of Mentos for this leg of the race. <laughs> have you looked at the Amazing Race Canada Facebook page this week yet? You mean with all the Mentos complaints? Oh no, there's a great one from last night that I'm not sure if you've seen yet or not. Is that the one you sent me? Because I couldn't find it anywhere on the page. No, the the one that I sent you is something different, which we will get to. But 
the one that Kurt tipped me off to was a woman complaining that spoilers Julian Lowell went out this week and that everyone should be given prize money. So I jokingly replied to her comment saying they do each eliminated team plays a game where they have to try and put as many packs of Mentos in their arms as they can. The more they carry, the more <laughs> money they're given, which is based off a quite famous TV show called Fort Bayard, which is one of the best game shows of all time. And yeah, she actually believed me. <laughs> she genuinely believed me that they had to run into a place, pick up packs of Mentos, and try and carry them in their arms to win prize money. It's like the equivalent of, do you want to get sticky with Mickey from Matilda? No one wants to get sticky with Mickey, trust me. Hey, it's John Lovitz. He's an excellent game show host. That's where you try to get all the money attached to your body after putting like oil and stuff on it, as if you were a Tongalese flag bearer. Topical reference. Yes, it is. This dates this podcast a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, apparently Kingston is where the St. Lawrence River connects Lake Ontario to the rest of the world. And I wasn't aware that Lake Ontario was connected to the rest of the world. Given that, you know, it's very landlocked. Oh, it does, Michael. Lake Ontario connects us to everything. It is the centre of our being, the centre of the universe, the centre of the collective soul of all of us. So yeah, I, I've learned something from Major Race Canada. Mm hmm. For once. Do you notice the whole law and order uh, timing effect that they did with the keep on racing part? Yeah, I I wasn't expecting any departure times this week, so knowing that Joel and Ashley left at 3.37 was actually quite cool. I wish we could have found out how far ahead um, Steph and Kristen were, but. Well, it was a 3.30 train, so I assume they were quite a ways ahead. And yeah, Joel and Ashley do leave at 3.37, seven minutes after Steph and Kristen leave Toronto. And in maybe my favourite scene of the episode, Frankie and Amy and um, Jillian and Emmett discussing who gave them the express pass. We're sworn to secrecy, but we told them we wouldn't tell anyone. <laughs> I love how Emmett thinks he was like, oh, we're, you know, we're really going to have to manipulate them to get that information out of them. And then it was like interrogating Homer Simpson, where, like, where Frankie just slips up within two seconds. Like, Emmett, and, Emmett asking Frankie and Amy about this information the way that Frankie's like, we're so sworn to secret, secrecy, we're not going to tell you. We have a, we, we, we made a pact with Steph and Chris and not to tell anyone. And, and it's like, they slipped as easily as, like, me when somebody asks me stuff to keep a secret when I'm drinking. Like, that information was up like that. The best thing about this is the fact that they did not need to even include this in the episode they wanted to because it has no impact on the rest of the episode it's just a really funny scene no like this whole express pass both express passes this is like i always make the joke that express passes are irrelevant in about every single season of the amazing race ever except for when gary and mallory used an unfinished business when they were nearly being eliminated but here it's like like, neither Express Pass changed anything at all in the race. It's just put in there for complete comedic value just because Frankie and Amy supposedly screw up theirs and nearly got eliminated last week. And then Steph and Kristen, you know, with all the deceiving and stuff with these comedic scenes, I guess that's why I got included because theirs doesn't come into play at all. Like, they don't even use it. Both Express Passes have something hilarious to do with them. Because we do have Frankie and Amy's awkward conversation with Gillian and Emma and Frankie accidentally revealing everything. And then we have the wondrousness that is Monty just littering the canals and uh, throwing away the Express Pass. Which is what everyone should do. It'll be funny is if the locksmith like lowers the thing for the water to get through and then the Express Pass goes along with it and the Express Pass just drifts through uh, the Great Lakes. Well, don't you know that the Express Pass task for uh, Amazing Race Canada 5 is just going to be dive into Lake Ontario and find it? We'll tell you it's in Lake Ontario somewhere. You have to dive and find it. If you get it, then you keep it. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that would actually be an interesting continuation. Apart from the fact that Lake Ontario is larger than... Well, three times as large as, I think, the largest English county. 
Yeah, I think Steph and Kristen may give up a bit sooner on that than they did with the crates. Yeah. And is this the earliest expiration date for an Express Pass? Barely halfway into the season? No, actually. Because Amazing Race 27 was leg four, if you remember. Isn't that when they had to give it away, though? It was the relay one. So Tanner and oh, Josh right. had to use it by the end of leg four, and then had to immediately palm it off to someone else. And they then mm. had to use it the next leg. That's a bit asterisky one, because it still was going to, that express pass had to be used again after that. And when did John and Murray's express pass in Amazing Race Australia 3 have to be used by? I don't know, but they didn't get it to its expiration date. <laughs> I think that might have been like 5 or 6. Okay. So I'd say it's on the early end, but it's not the earliest. Okay. So, we, you know, we just come off of season 28 where Kurt and Brody didn't even get theirs until the sixth round. <laughs> but then they had to use it in two legs. No, it was three, I think. They had three chances to use it. I thought they had to use it by the end of leg eight. Shows how much attention we paid to uh, Amazing Race 28, by the way. Yeah, maybe it was leg eight. Who, I... So what was the round out? Well, they got it in. Uh... They got it in Dubai. No, they didn't. No, they got it in. Uh... Oh, they, they got, got it in the Caucasus. Like... Yeah, yeah, they got it in Georgia, didn't they? Yeah, and then they, then there was the Dubai round, and then there was the two Indonesia legs. I thought they would have been that they might have stayed alive in the race if they used it in the final. Oh no, maybe it was just two rounds then, because it was those two, those two legs ran right together. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was two legs because then because they would have used it at the end of the first Indonesia leg I guess because the I remember reading that because the two legs didn't have any uh, hours of operation together and how you know how season 28 was notorious for having really quick rounds of play and keeping everyone together that would have been enough to keep Curtin Brody in the race even with the double U-turn but they they left in like 10 so it definitely had expired by them yeah but I mean, like, they would have used it before. So, contrary to what we actually believed at the end of last week's episode, Joel and Ashley do miss the last train and have to stay in Toronto for the night. But they get saved by an hour's of operation, so in a sense, we are right. Yeah, shocker. And there are so many complaints about that happening, by the way. I had a quick glance over the complaints on the Facebook page. It's, it is a lot of... Why? It's so unfair that there's an hour of operation. Steph and Kristen should have been 15 hours ahead of everyone. That would have been funnier, but then there would have been an equalizer next round anyway. It didn't seem like the the equalizer this like impacted Stefan Kristen too much. Yeah, do you remember the controversy over the hours of operation in Zanzibar in Amazing Race All Stars? About how it was a clear sky and oh no, there's too high winds for us to sail. Michelle or in Mina. Oh yeah, because they didn't wanna because the rumor is that Production didn't want them to get too big of a lead. Then cue the Poland like. <laughs> yeah, it seemed very light out when uh, Steph and Kristen came across that hours of operation. I think the market was probably still open. They just hadn't set up anything for the next leg yet. Well, yeah, they started to stay behind and stick with uh, Joel and Ashley. So it makes sense in a way. Probably didn't have the Chevrolet vehicles all, put to, uh, all assembled together. And... I should point out that this episode, I guess there's a random crew that got to tag along with production this like. There is. They like putting journos around for one of the episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last year they did that with the India leg, and then this year they did it with the uh, Kingston leg. Not Kingston, Jamaica. Kingston, Ontario. I love how irrelevant Liz Watts her face, not Devin Salsendeek, has been as well. What has she done? Has she just been interviewing teams at the pit stop and that's been it? I haven't seen anything from her. At all. And yet she was put in one of the cast photos with Monty for some reason. I know that there's been clips saying, oh, watch Liz, you know, interview this teams for... The I guess she's been essentially just conducting these mat chats, I guess, the little clips that uh, teams do after they check into the pit stop. But that's been it for her from what I can tell. I haven't bothered with any of the scenes because... You can sort of fill in the blanks when it's her or a Devin Sultan Deek that are interviewing the teams at the pit stop when it's like looser Amazing Race fans and just not making the interviews all that entertaining. It's sort of between Monty and the social. Yeah, it's the halfway point. The Liz Not Sultan Deek um, interviews basically 
don't have a BMO representative there to cheat for the, uh, the questions for them. <laughs> so once teams wait for uh, the hours of operation, they have to head to Clarence Streets, where there are literally tens of sponsor cars badly parked, and six locked tablets. Teams must use the number plates of the cars, which all have four-digit codes on them, and unlock one of the tablets and use the app on the tablet to unlock their car, which contains their next clue. And the, my first thought when I saw that was, they are terribly parked, because they're just parked across the base. That is really quite annoying. Well, I guess they got to take over that whole area, so it didn't really matter overall. It's like, we can just park it however we want to. I'm slightly OCD about parking, so that actually quite annoyed me. I will keep reparking the car until uh, until it's done properly. Just to backtrack a little bit, but what was interesting with Emmett interrogating Frankie and Amy when he finds out it was Steph and Kristen who uh, gave them the express pass, so Emmett's like, oh, they lied to us, they're just snakes. And I'm thinking, Emmett, what happened to deal, deal, deal? Did you just conveniently forget that whole thing? <laughs> oh, we trust them. I believe them. I believe in Emmett and Jillian. What? Emmett, we can't, we can't go for the express pass. We don't want to search through all those crates. I thought you just go there and grab it. Hopefully the girls don't get mad at us. That whole conversation between all the teams apart from Joel and Ashley and Steph and Kristen in, uh, in Toronto is just gloriousness. Because it's just, oh, we believed them. How could they lie? And then with Emmett leading the charge, it's like, Emmett, come on. You should be the, the very last guy talking about that. Also, something I have remembered from Union Station, for about a week I did hold a um, high score on a sort of VR game that they have there, because they have this massive set of screens on one of the walls, where you can play a uh, basically a keepy uppy game, and I was peeing off all the kids who were there by continually dominating at it. Because I'm a horrible <laughs> person. I didn't get to see that when I was at Union Station. They might have taken it out now, this was four years ago. Okay, yeah, cause the last, the only time I've been to Toronto was a year and a half ago, and I was there for one weekend, and one of those days was spent at a restaurant for my brother's uh, wedding ceremony thing, and that was all, all, that was pretty much took up half of Saturday right there. So we only had Sunday to check out, uh, to go to the CN Tower, actually just the first half of Sunday to do that, just to check out the CN Tower, and I think one other location. Yeah, and then not nothing significant though. It's just really CN Tower, and then we had to go back to the airport. So it was like a little over about 48 hours or so in Toronto. And my one note on this task was yes, Teresa and Yvette finally speaking French to each other. <laughs> we were promised it, and damn it, finally we got it. When was this? This was uh, when they were bickering about about unlocking the box during the Chevrolet task. Oh, I didn't even notice. But there was a bit a bit of Rita and Yvette French in there. Damn it. Just made me miss Stefan and Antoine. Or Ellen and Audre, who's apparently in Suicide Squad. Yeah, F you, Wayne, for spoiling it, because I wanted to announce that on the podcast. I actually had it written in my notes for this week, because Mark Carroll tipped me off to it. Yeah, Alain even has it in his little Twitter uh, bio now that he was in Suicide Squad. Alain off of Audre is the big bad of Suicide Squad. Spoilers. Well, not that you can, you know, tell anything because he's all CGI, but... <laughs> so with Alain, um, is he, have you seen the movie yet? I have not. Neither have I. It sounds like it's a pretty big role he has in it, though. Yeah, he's like the big bad. Oh, the main villain. Yeah, from what I've heard. So that's a huge boost to his career, then. You get to be the main villain in a movie with Will Smith? Even better, he, he basically didn't meet any of the actors until right at the end. Oh, really? Yeah, because his was all basically done with um, mocap in Toronto, I think, and they were all filming in LA. Not of Audrey. I was reading oh. an interview with him last night about it. He did geek out when he met Will Smith, though, apparently. I don't know if I would have that same reaction to Will Smith in 2016. I mean... Ever since he let his son be in the remake for Karate Kid, I just lost about 90% of my respect for Will Smith in that moment. So, if you met Will Smith, you would not be reciting the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme tune, because I would. Uh, I may do an Ali impression. Anyway, enough about Chip and Kim. Wow, we really went on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Elaine is the, uh, the connection between Will Smith and Chip and Kim. One was in the original, one was in the, the next... 
Ollie film 30 years later. So, Rita and Yvette left in first with Frankie and Amy, Joel and Ashley, Gillian and Emmett, Stephen Kristen and Julian Lowell leaving after them. And it's a detour, which we're actually not sure of the names of, because officially it's, an, it's on the field versus offshore, but Monty and the on-screen captions said it was higher education or high seas. I don't know whether you noticed that. Yeah, I did. I had both detour options written down. It's like a detour within the detour, which they couldn't even... It's up to the audience to decide which detour options to write down as the official one. It's their call. <laughs> On the field or higher education? It's like a comedian that uh, only has like 10 fans in the audience, so he just tries to read off as many jokes as possible to see what hits. Similar concept here. Just write as many detour option names as possible and see which one sticks. In fact, I'm going to tweet Monty and ask why that happened. Because I'm greatly insulted. Yeah. Maybe they were they're like, on the field or offshore? I don't know. This is serious business, guys. We really have to put effort into coming up with the detour option names. Let's have a backup here. And you know, Monty can't exactly avoid my tweets anymore, so he will actually have to answer it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, occasionally the US does this, but they never actually get Phil to read it out if they've changed the names in post. Hmm. They will always just... Um, have him do the voiceover if you if he notices. Usually when Phil does the right. voiceover, you can tell that they've changed the names in post. And this is an incredibly nerdy conversation. <laughs> it's important, Michael. This is hard-hitting stuff. It is. So, in On the Field or Higher Education, teams must head to one of the fields of Queen's University where they will wear a bubble suit off of the Running with the Balls detail from Major Race 24 and then complete a drill made up of a front flip a passing exercise, and then scoring on a goalkeeper who will try and tackle them. If they complete the drill properly in under 25 seconds, they receive their next clue. And in offshore or high seas, teams must head to the Kingston Yacht Club, learn how to rig up a sailboat properly, and then sail a boat to a boy where they can collect their next clue. And also, did you notice the terrible edit on Ashley's quote about the uh, the U-turn? Uh, no, I did not. Well, they started off with her actually saying it to Joel, and then, like, halfway through the sentence, had her talking um, as if it had been dubbed over, basically. We gotta keep the momentum going, though. We gotta get to that U-turn board before the other teams. Oh, because she would have been talking about it probably in the past tense, saying hints that she was the one U-turn. Yeah, it was just a, a blatant edit. If you go back and look at it, or go back and listen again, you'll notice it. Mm hmm Because it's really, really obvious. Okay. Um... And this is also the point where we find out that Leg 7 is the last opportunity for Steph and Kristen to use their Express Pass. That surprised me. Which did surprise me, because I was wondering about when they had to use it by. I guess we, we talked earlier about when the earliest expiration date was internationally, but is that the earliest uh, within Canada? Oh yeah. Yeah, Canada it's usually Leg 8 or 9. Even in the first season? Yeah, I think Kristen Darren's was 9. They could have used it at the penultimate leg, eh? That would that's crazy. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was earlier than that. Yeah, I I, I personally prefer it where when they have twists that, you know, they let it run its course through to the end of the season. So I think with stuff like an express pass, which is a pretty pointless twist to begin with, but to make it slightly less pointless and have it be actively on the racers' minds, they should at least have it in play and until right before the end of the game. But it does also basically give the team immunity from all the U-turns of the season if they play it correct. Eh, not if they get U-turn multiple times. No, but if they basically reveal they have it or it's revealed that they have it and they say, look, it's pointless U-turning me because we'll use the Express Pass. Or possibly teams will just not share as much information with them and try to, you know, put them at a disadvantage if they know that they have power for a lot longer. When it just expires by leg seven, then nobody's, nobody's really going to care. Yeah, I mean, that was the tactic that I used when we were doing the ORG. was just make it blatantly obvious that we have the Express Pass, we're going to use it, and it will be a waste if we if you do use it us. So there's no point. Go for bigger targets. Yeah, we bluffed, we bluffed our way through it, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> we used, so I had to use it on the slide puzzle. Yes, you did. <laughs> that dreaded slide puzzle. Oh. Oh, I'm neither so, of us wanted to do. I'm so glad that you got that. <laughs> I still remember my rea reaction to that. I probably should have been a bit more sympathetic, but I was just laughing for about five minutes at you. 
I'm a horrible person. <laughs> so the bubble gives uh, Emmett some time away from Jillian, which obviously he greatly relishes. And Jillian's reaction to being in the bubble is quite hilarious. She didn't like the bubble that much. She did not. Still trying to yell at Emmett through it, which was pretty hilarious. Yeah, I was going to say, she could still shout at Emmett through it, though. Yeah. It's like feeling through the, the, through the torch masks from uh, last week. Why did you kick that away? Emmett! Love, what are you doing? Do you notice what the Chevrolet tagline was that, the, that they had? put the, I'm not sure if it was in your version of the episode that you saw, but that they had to put the Chevrolet tagline at the bottom of the screen, and considering some of the banter back and forth between teams and some of the jokes being made, I thought it was fitting that the Chevrolet tagline for the vehicle they used this round was that it's for the mature-ish. Yeah, I, I automatically blank out any, any sponsorship generally, unless it's the egregious Mentos one. Mm-hmm. John A. Mentenos, I think, was their first prime minister. It was. No, no, no. John A. Mentano. That's what it was. John A. McDonald, sponsored by Mentos. The inaugural maker. Inaugurated maker. Inaugural, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Man, he, the first prime minister has all the Mentos. He's, very, he's in a very prosperous state. Um, so, Steph and Kristen leave on the field in first... And teams now have to find the Kingston Penitentiary, the site of the U-turn board. And then actually get stuck in the bubble, which is awesome. You can <laughs> completely understand why they cast Ashley on this season. It's not for the whole First Nations advocate or anything. It's because her reactions are, like, dialed up to 100 on everything. She was like a turtle on her back in that bubble. She's just so ridiculous at everything. <laughs> But it's kind of awesome. I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> Get me out of here, guys. I don't. I can't find my way out. <laughs> Escaping from prison is one thing, but this Zor bubble is a whole nother. And Jillian and Emmett leave on the field in second. Because Emmett played soccer since he was four years old. He was part of the orange team. Is there anything that Emmett has not done? I don't know. Apparently he's a great speaker, he plays soccer, he's done welding. Uh, he, uh, what was the thing from earlier on in the season that he was... Oh, yeah, motorcycle repair. Um, next he's gonna... He, he's trying to compete with Debbie for, like, the most occupations ever. Next thing you know, he's gonna brag about being able to, oh, I don't know, uh, unicycle. Maybe he's the better... He was... He got... Cam and Darius to teach him how to unicycle. They really should change Emmett's lower third every time, just to say, motorcycle enthusiast. Or red lobster waitress. Model. <laughs> yeah, model. Reality, reality TV contestant. Nova Scotian town crier. A professional juggler. <laughs> Debbie was so fun to talk to oh. at the Survivor 32 finale. Debbie is, is probably the one person who you met who I am really, really jealous that you met. She was the first person I got to talk to. I told her how that my mother was a huge fan of hers. And she's like, you know what, Logan? Uh, about half of my fa- fans are middle-aged women. She just seemed so much fun. She was. Yeah, I actually got to talk to her, I think, a couple of times during the night. And there were a couple of complaints that were like, oh, she's putting on an act. I don't think she was. I think that is genuinely how she is in real life. That's what I got from her in conversation, yeah. She is genuinely just that mad cat lady kind of person. Mm-hmm. Where, yeah, I essentially complimented her, and then she went on a whole tangent about uh, how that's true, essentially. I'm completely not shocked by that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Jillian and Emmett leave on the field in second, just in time for Steph and Kristen to U-turn them. But they also think about Rita and Yvette because they don't have a relationship with them, just like the uh, editors don't. It's easier emotionally for them to U-turn Rita and Yvette it's Amazing Race Canada, you can U-turn as many times as you want. It doesn't matter. And this was probably the only U-turn of the season. Mm. Now nah, there's going to be another one, probably in two episodes. Let's be honest, there was a surprise in the preview that there's going to be a double battle coming up, but Muncie also introduced it as the first one of the season. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I noticed that, I noticed that too, that there's going to be at least two face-offs, just... 
that's just trying to throw all these things in right into the last little bit of the of the season. Whether that be 11 or 12 rounds, we don't know yet. Wasn't it last season that I complained that having one at the final four was pointless and basically guaranteed who the final three was going to be? Oh yes, it was. If they have one at the final four, I'll be very, very annoyed. And uh, there was, oh, that was my other question. Um, with this being the first U-turn of the season, is that the latest to have the first U-turn in uh, Amazing Race Canada? Yeah, in Amazing Race Canada, definitely. Because there's only four seasons to go off. Yeah. Amazing Race US, not so much, because I remember they saved the double U-turn in Season 17 until the Bangladesh leg. I think that was probably the latest one. That was, like, Lake 9. Yeah, Lake 9's the, the latest we've ever seen the first one, I think. Um, and Gillian and Emmett, U-turn, Joel and Ashley, because they know they're behind them. That's what you gotta do. Although they probably had a good sense that Julie and Lowell were behind them. <laughs> but it it's all made worthwhile when Joel and Ashley leave on the field in third, and when they get to the board, what exactly is Ashley's reaction? She called them a fart face. She called them fart faces, which is such a six-year-old insult. <gasps> fart faces. No way. <laughs> it is. I think she knew that the camera would be on her, being like, okay... Your reaction to the U-turn has a 99% chance of making it into the episode. And instead of dropping a, a series of F-bombs like I would expect Ashley to do, uh, she dropped a different type of F-bomb. Yeah, well, your fart faces. No. <laughs> it would be funny if, the, if like, her first reaction was to drop a C-bomb and, and then the producers right there are like, no, 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 we gotta reshoot that. We can't put that on air. We we can't have Mrs. Universe dropping the C-bomb on Canadian national television. They walk up to the U-turn button, she just goes, BALLS! Yeah. <laughs> or she initially called them fuckfaces or something like that. It's like, no, 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 we, we can't have that. <laughs> or she just channels her in a roof at bottom and goes, WHO THE FUCK YOU TURNED ME?! <laughs> yeah. Jillian and just Emmett! shaking... You just start shaking the board and choking it. <laughs> and you like how Joel was trying to come off as a big badass with his little ramble, like, oh man, uh, all the rulers exact words, it was hilarious. It was like him trying to say something really intimidating, but didn't come off intimidating at all. Where he's like, oh, they're going to pay for what they did. But it was like in such a dad-like tone where it's like, yeah, I don't think Emin and Jillian are exactly shaking in their boots, Joel. He's too calm for that. He barely had a reaction to being U-turned. Um, so Jillian and Lowell uh, switch to offshore. Why did they switch? They seem like they were having a wonderful time in soccer. I think had it not been a race, they probably would have continued because it looked like they were having a lot of fun. But mm -hmm. Lowell couldn't see anything and was missing the ball. That is not the sort of task that you want to go for. With his eyesight, it was like him having to do the the roadblock from from the Argentina leg all over again. Yeah, they they also didn't say in the clue that it was going to be basically Zorbing. Because I don't think they would have gone for that one first had it been Zorbing. Yeah, if they said, you'll be in a Zorb, they'll be like, yeah, I think Lowell's vision will be a bit obscured if they, if they knew it was a Zorb beforehand. He really tried, though. I mean, he was trying to find any way to see the ball, but then Julie, having essentially a blindfold task where the time limit is 25 seconds, as Julie said, that, that's a, that's a, it's looking a bit grim. He really is the little blind tug tugboat who could. I'm sure it really bothered him that he wasn't able to finish off that task. You could tell that he was trying to use whatever whatever remaining vision he has left to do it, but ah, that was that was impossible. By all accounts, Lowell seems like quite a badass. Obviously, mm -hmm. he's not gone to the Paralympics because he's doing the, uh, the press rounds today, but by all accounts, he seems like a massive badass, and um, I bet it did absolutely kill him inside that he came across a task that he couldn't do. But yeah... Just because he came across a task that he couldn't do doesn't mean that he didn't try. And actually, I'm not sure I would have gone for the football. Yeah, if it said 25 second time, I would have thought, oh, you can probably do it quickly. But I'd rather have something you can control. Mm -hmm. 
And just to note, they were already lagging behind because it seemed like Steph and Kristen were already at the detour before Julie and Lola had even unlocked their car. Yeah, they got really unlucky. Yeah, as Emmett said, it was all just luck, and I guess must have been the last one for him, because it didn't seem like there was that many cars to try. Especially as cars are leaving. When the cars are leaving, there's that that many uh, fewer options to choose from. Yeah, they ended up just writing down all the numbers and trying them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, Julie and Lowell arrived just in time for Frankie and Amy to leave offshore in fourth, which is actually second, and... Can you remember what uh, Julie's reaction to Joel and Asher being U-turned was? Wasn't it like, oh, at least it's not us or something like that? Ah, oh, boo! <laughs> I thought we were all playing nice together. It's such a motherly reaction. It's just, oh, boo. Boo them, those fart faces. It'd be funny if Julie is the one who swears at the U-turn board. Yeah, Julie swears like a sailor. <laughs> Which is fitting for doing that task. She got to the U-turn board and called uh, Jillian and Emmett motherfuckers for U-turning their friends. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of Emma and Jillian, besides Jillian complimenting, she's, is she the first person to compliment herself on how she looks being U-turned on the U-turn board? <laughs> she was just admiring herself. Like, she would have just stuck around for another ten minutes being like, oh my god, that was such a great picture of us. Look at the angle. The photographer did a wonderful job. Oh, Emmett. Look, look, wait, 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 we can we can wait to go to sales. We know how far Julie and Lull are behind us, but man, look, 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 look at our jaw lines. Look at our jaw lines, Emmett. It used to be a very yield thing to do. When teams were just stuck there admiring their yeah. picture, it used to be the and sort of thing that they go, oh, we, yeah, we look so awesome. But it doesn't really happen with U-turns that much anymore. Well, no, because it's all in a hurry, but if you're, like, in dead last and you get no chance of catching up, then you can then you can start doodling. One thing I did notice, though, was that it's a very amazing Red Canada thing, but their pictures for the U-turns are different to their promo pictures and the pictures that appear in the titles. Because the US uses the title pictures. They film the sort of head turn thing or whatever teams do, and then they take a picture as well, which is the U-turn picture usually. Until last season. You know what they need to... Season, yeah. Because if you remember last season, Amazing Race US 28, they did have different pictures of the U-turn ones because they took a serious one and a piss takey one. And the piss takey ones were the ones they used for the U-turns. Right. Yeah, I don't really remember that because there was one U-turn used the last season. Yeah, it was very obvious in the Bali U-turn because I remember Tyler and Corey admiring their silly face picture, basically. Oh, right. Yeah, I remember that now. I remembered that mid-sentence because I was going to say that the US doesn't do it at all, but it does. And what was with Emin and Jillian? Uh, why did they have to lie about being U-turned? Hmm. I'm not sure. I think it's probably to protect the knowledge that they'd U-turn Joel and Ashley. Oh, it just seems to be like, who would you U-turn? But then they're lying anyway. They Either way, they'd be forced, they'd, they'd, be, uh, have, they'd have to lie to everyone else. They're, they become the new Steph and Kristen. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to overtake Steph and Kristen as U10 targets, honestly. No, no, not at all. I love how, how Frankie and Amy completely bought it. Like, these interactions with Emin and Joey and this, like, they're just being completely owned by them. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's like, they wouldn't be U10 already. They wouldn't lie. They, well, they, couldn't, they couldn't have already completed the other task, go to the U10 board, and come back here. Come on. They haven't been, it's not like they've beat us by two or three hours uh, in some of the other Canadian legs this season. It was wonderful to to see how trusting Frankie and Amy are. Mm -hmm. So naive. So innocent. It adds fuel to the, the theory that maybe they're getting the winner's edit. Yeah. Maybe it's, I'm slightly leaning towards Lorita and Yvette by the end of this episode. All the sort of positive-ish scenes that we're getting from them. Mm-hmm. It's adding up. But still, the airtime for Rita and Yvette, I mean, it is a winner's edit, but it's on such a small scale. It's little bits here and there. It's just like the editors remember halfway through editing the episode that, oh, actually, yeah, Rita and Yvette are still here, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's just that you haven't gotten any big footage from Rita and Yvette, that they haven't really been involved in any of the major uh, subplots. Yeah. Mind you, now the Express Pass is gone, we should uh, we should see a bit more oh, time yeah. for all the Oh yeah, a whole bunch of new storylines, yeah. That's true. Maybe the face-off will start off some new rivalry. 
Maybe it'll just be a machete. <laughs> um, so Gillian and Emmett leave offshore in fifth, which is actually third. And then Rita and Yvette leave offshore in sixth, which is actually fourth. And then they sail away from the dock. Yeah. They, they're about to disembark, and then they just keep spinning around. <laughs> like Kylie Minogue. And um, then we get the gloriousness that is Ashley on the sailboat. What if it tips? <laughs> and then they break the rudder. They break <laughs> the rudder of the boat. How is that possible? How is that possible? Damn it. I was about to break out the the Brooke impression. The Brooke impression that slowly morphs into um into Bethany yeah, Hamilton. Bethany Hamilton. Yes. How was that possible? And it was jo- wasn't it Joel who broke the rudder? Yeah, Joel broke the rudder. He's gonna pay for what he did to that boat. And um then they leave it offshore in seventh, which is actually fifth. And then Lowell overboard. I'm glad we actually got someone to <laughs> fall in the water. But the best bit about this was not Lowell falling in the water. It was the fact that Julie went, Oh, I'm here anyway. I might as well get the clue before I help my blind husband get out of the water. From, yeah, from drowning. <laughs> Those life jackets will do the job. Yeah, it'll be fine. They wouldn't let us die on here. <laughs> like, this has been like the, it'll turn out to be like the worst batch of tasks for Lowell. And, and, just, you know, just right in the middle of it, it's like, we we might not get eliminated. And then, you know, Lol falls off the boat and into the water. It's like, yeah, maybe we are getting eliminated. It's just that kind of day. So yeah, Julie and Lowell leave offshore in last. And teams must now search the penitentiary for the next clue, which is hidden in one of the 400 cells of the prison. Although I think by this point, Steph and Kristen were already done the leg. <laughs> And there is literally nothing to say about this task unless you're talking about Julian Lowell. So Stephen Kristen leaving first, with Julian and Emmett in second, uh, Frankie and Amy in third, Rita and Yvette in fourth, and Joel and Ashley in fifth. And then Julian Lowell have a little holiday searching around Kingston Penitentiary, talking about forks and fork get that. And Lowell completely misses the clue, but Julie then finds it and they leave in last. After Julie missed a clue earlier, what's her excuse? She's not the one that has, like, 95% of her vision gone. Yeah, Julie. I think Fran and Barry would have beat Julia finding that <laughs> clue. And teams must now find Bellevue House, the Kingston residence of Canada's First Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, to get their next clue. And I was very proud of myself. I knew that John Macdonald was, um, John A. Macdonald was the First Prime Minister before Monty actually said it. That's great. Yeah. Canada. Only because I'd been to Fort Gallagher, but, you know. We get a roadblock like this every single season. There's always a, there's always a parliamentary theme task, and more often than not, it involves memorizing outfits or a speech, and here it is, memorizing a parliamentary speech. But the this is basically the Suki Atwell memorial task, because she owned this in season two. Mm-hmm. Also had that similar uh, background as uh, Ashley did. Exactly. Pageant girls. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this leg, when, you know, with getting these increasingly lamer and lamer locations whenever they go to Eastern Canada for the past, well, I mean, it's, these locations have always been, been lame, but now that they're getting even lamer, just, I don't know why, why they're so adamant about having these rounds where all the locations are like, being geared towards a fourth grade social studies class. Like, this is the amazing race. Like, this isn't really a top of the line stuff that uh, producers are organizing here. But Canada, we got to be proud of Canada. From sea to sea to sea, I know. But it, it, it's like one of these legs that I would be, if it wasn't for this cast, this round probably would have been one of the worst ones ever would have like fit in with half of the rounds they did in season one where i would just wait over a week to watch the episode do you remember the name of the uh, the episode title of um the finale last year cheers to you canada or it something wa- like that it was indeed cheers to you canada they are just playing up the patriotism no other reason yeah it's it's really disturbing that i mean and we've talked about this before but just the how extreme our America phobia is, where it's like even if 
even though like the American, like last season is considered one of the worst seasons for Amazing Race US, and yet they still went to Colombia, Georgia, and Armenia. And here we're going to Kingston, Ontario, and you know, and freaking Hamilton and back to back episodes and you know, the low, like the route markers. Nobody cared where any of these route markers were. One was on a university campus and you know, and one was like in the middle of a parking lot to get a Chevrolet vehicle and and the old uh, what was the coolest one? Uh, you know, uh, uh, the prison, I guess, where the task was only shown for two seconds. Oh yeah, I, I know why Amazing Race Canada went to um, Kingston, and it's because one of the heads of production, I think, of CTV is from Kingston, and basically had been badgering Major Race Canada production to go there until they said, fine, we'll go there. And then, because Kingston Penitentiary had been decommissioned in 2013, they then built the leg around it. Mm. So, it was the only reason that they actually wanted to go to Kingston, I think. Okay. It wasn't a Sudbury situation. It's going to be interesting next season to see a lot more international destinations open up. Hopefully, I just can't see like this season, and we're, we're already we're so, we're we've been stretched so thin with the locations, that are with the Canadian destinations anyway. That it just seems impossible to do to stretch it out even thinner. Like the best we've had so far for Canada destination this season has been Haida Gwaii and maybe Jasper. I thought that last year. But we still came up with a few ideas of places they would go, and they knocked that out this season, essentially, right in the first you know, few episodes. But now I, there's nothing left. Yeah, I, I thought it last year. And, I mean, I wrote the blog in April about how Amazing Race Canada is a franchise on the brink, and I'm, I'm probably going to do a follow-up to that after the season finishes. But I really cannot see Amazing Race Canada lasting too much longer if we don't get any more international destinations next year. Because you could revolve a season around Commonwealth countries or countries with a massive Canadian expat community. I mean, mm -hmm. it's criminal the UK hasn't been visited. We are not only the motherland we used to own you until 1871, but also there's huge Canadian expat communities all over the UK. I mean, Manchester, the nearest city to me, is has the flagship store of Second Cup in Europe, for example, and is very Canadian themed. And there's now right. about, there's now about five or six Second Cups in the UK, just because mm -hmm. Second Cup is that popular over here. There's huge Canadian expat communities in, especially in Europe, but around the world. And it is criminal that if they want to pay, play up to the patriotism, that they're going to boring ass places in Canada rather than opening. Canadians' minds to the world. And also, it's not as if they've got the excuse of visa issues, because Commonwealth countries, you can stay in if you've got a Commonwealth passport, so there's about 70 countries around the world, where you can stay there for 90 days easily without any visas. Yeah, and it's just, like, I'm thinking, what locations are left? And I, I was even looking up, like, the most populated cities in Canada, and all of the most populated ones that they haven't visited are all in Ontario and Quebec. And they're not, and they don't have that many people in them for by a city city standard. Like the largest one in BC that they haven't gone to is my hometown of Abbotsford, and there are no landmarks in Abbotsford whatsoever. I can't even think of important places they could go to that would impress the other viewers. And just this season as a whole, I don't really see too many people. Uh, talking about as much compared to previous seasons. I feel like it's really like the popularity of Amazing Race Canada has really dwindled down this year, even with the incredible cast. I think, like, especially I can speak with uh, my relatives and, like, especially with my, my brother in law's family and that whole get together where they're all making fun of Sudbury as a location during the third season. That I feel like people just are giving up until they bring back international destinations uh, a lot more frequently. Or maybe they won't even come back into it because they think that's that having Canadian locations for two-thirds of the race is how it's always going to be. I mean, I, I want this to be a major topic when we do the finale podcast about where Amazing Race Canada can go, so I, I don't really want to properly get into it this week. 
but it, it's crazy to me that they've not gone to the U.S. yet either. Oh, they'll never go to the U.S. Like the America phobia within, especially within like the Canadian television market, I think, uh, is significant amongst a certain uh, percentage of the population. Like there's that's a it's actually a pretty prevalent attitude throughout Canada is just try and distinguish ourselves from things that aren't American. So even if like, say, you know, a place in the States comes up with some sort of really effective cure for cancer, and then a Canadian comes up with that same cure that's not quite as effective, we're still going to promote that Canadian cure. Like we're that, we're that stubborn. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just crazy to me that they've not even had a leg or two in the US just because international legs in the US are always terrible. The best international leg in the U.S. is probably from Hammer Oz. So, oh, with being buried alive? With the being buried alive and just them going full pelt on Vegas's effing crazy. But Oh yeah, the strip poker. <laughs> the, well, the, stri that. the strip poker, the being buried alive, the trick-or-treat task, the one of the roadblocks being um, dress as a superhero and carry, a, carry your partner and a cardboard cut out of a car. Um, along a street, but you have to get changed in under 20 seconds into your Lycra in the time it takes for a door to revolve. <laughs> That's so stupid. It's ripe for Amazing Race Canada to step in and do a badass American like, even if it had to be somewhere like Vegas or LA or New York, rather than some of the more interesting American cities. No, yeah, they'll just go to Churchill, Manitoba next season. Like that's the one. That's the best location I can think of is Churchill, Manitoba. That's the polar bear theme. Gone to because there's polar bears. Yes, yes, polar bears. That's it. That's awesome. And it's a tiny town. Where's Monty from? Oh, isn't he? Yeah, I want to say like Winnipeg or. It's not Winnipeg. It's I can't remember where it is. It, it's definitely somewhere in Manitoba. Though. Let's Google it. But I'm very surprised that they've not been to Monty's hometown yet. Nah, if they do another eight legs in Canada next season, they'll pretty much have to choose that by default. If that one random producer got to go to Kingston, I'm sure they can go to Monty's town. It'll just be a tour of going to every producer's hometown next season. If one person in the class gets to do it, then everybody in the class has to. Russell. That's where he's from. Russell, Manitoba. I didn't even know there was a Russell, Manitoba. Yeah, Hans or, um, or Swan, it's your choice. Yeah. <gasps> they should so go to Russell Manis over and do a detour of Swan or Hans. This one involves fainting and the other just involves berating one of the other contestants. It's their call, Hans or, or Swan. <laughs> so, once teams get to Bellevue House, it's uh, at the roadblock of the leg, which is who wants to be first. And in this roadblock, one team member must dress as John A. MacDonald, learn one of his speeches, and perform it for the crowd to get their next clue. And it's Kristen, Emma, Amy, Yvette, Ashley, and Lowell doing this roadblock. Do you think John... I just love that the Mentos was beside John A. McDonald while writing his speech. I thought it was Emmett. Wasn't it Emmett cribbing his... Emma, yeah, but yeah, Emmett dressed up as John A. McDonald. But still, like, just... That would change the Heritage Minute completely. I don't know if you've seen those, Michael, but it's like those one-minute Heritage videos about Canadian history. And I'm just picturing the John A. McDonald one where he just throws, like, three or four Mentos in his mouth, and he's like, it's time. He just picks it up and goes, Tch -tch -tch, Mentos o'clock! <laughs> Mentos o'clock. <laughs> hmm. We're going to export Mentos. That's how we're going to boost the Canadian economy. Mentos, Mentos, and more Mentos. That's how we'll show the British Empire. I'm very surprised that um, Stefan Christen didn't use the Express Pass. Just to guarantee that they would get a win. Maybe they didn't want to win by too large of a margin. Why? <laughs> Why would you not want they to? They don't want to be show-offs. <laughs> yeah, but the whole point of getting the Express Pass is basically to be a show-off if it's the last task before the pit stop of the last leg you can use it on. I don't know, because I would say it's pretty badass to just show up to the pit stop and be like, here, we don't even need our Express Pass. I feel really bad for Steph and Kristen because they are the bridesmaid in this situation of the fact that the Vietnam winners this year did the exact same thing, and they were the first ones to do it. And they had it for three additional rounds. They got it at the first pit stop, and it expired at the end of leg nine, if I'm not mistaken. Had Steph and Kristen been 
a couple of months earlier, they would have got the title of the first people to not even need an express pass. But no, they are the bridesmaid here. I'm sure 99.9% .9 of the Canadian viewers aren't even aware that Vietnam All-Stars holds the record. Also, it would have robbed us of the awesome moment of Monty just chucking it into the grass. Express pass, gonzo. No longer oh, usable. No. So, you know, thank you for not using it, girls. We just employed a groundskeeper, fellas. Canadian jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Canadian jobs for Canadians. Amazing Race Canada, decreasing the unemployment rate one percentile at a time. I will say that Kristen absolutely killed it on this robot. I was very impressed. I just saw how how turned on Steph was by Kristen being in the in the in the Sir John A. Not maybe not Sir John A. McDonald, probably like Sir John A. Ma putting the Mac down McDonald. <laughs> I love how terrible the costumes were as well. They were so ill-fitting for everyone. I also started a poll on Twitter where you can vote for either Kristen's wig or actress Kristen wig. Kristen wig is winning by by thirty three percent. Kristen Wig or Kristen's Wig? Yes. Which one? Kristen Wig. Ah, Kristen. The actress. Yeah. She's winning. Oh, good. I think Lowell actually rocks it the best. He was the only person who suited it. Mm-hmm. Compared to how terrible everyone else was. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, he could have been, like, one of the characters straight out of Jane Eyre. Lowell is Mr. Darcy. Yeah. I can't believe you caught on to that reference. I was expecting crickets there. Compared to all of my references, you picked up on a Jane Eyre one. I'm, I'm quite knowledgeable, thank you very much. <laughs> I was like, is anybody going to understand that there's a slight blind reference to Jane Eyre, the book that everyone slept through while reading during the first year of university? Uh, so yeah, Kristen leaves the roadblock in first and gets the episode title of I Could Be Prime Minister. And then Emmett loves Canada, but doesn't know what a larder is. What is a larder? A larder? It's a Russian car, yes. I thought a lot of was when, uh, was, uh, what was it, when, uh, when Boston Rob is angry that somebody's yelling too loudly. I thought it was, um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger version of, uh, Not Quieter. Louder! 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 Louder. <laughs> Let them hear you sing! Get to the chopper! Get down! Protect the Prime Minister! Protect Kristen's wig. Not this Kristen wig bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we ever get Monty on on um, on the podcast, we should just ask him loads of Major Race Canada either or slightly rhyming questions. So like Kristen wig or Kristen's wig. So many detours for him to choose from. <laughs> and we have to come up with alternate options to rename each detour option. Oh, of course. I've tweeted him, by the way. <laughs> um... Yeah, so then Frankie mortifies her daughter by talking about uh, Amy's public speaking career in uh, high school. It's such a mom thing to say. She she rocked that speech competition in the fifth grade. And then Emmett talks about it coming out and uh, also inaugurated. Inaugurated. He's inaugurated. Inaugurated. Like, well, well, well. prosperous. I love how Emmett pulls a borderline Donald Trump of like, I, oh no, that was that was Jillian who said it. Who said that uh, Emmett is such a great speaker. He he knows words. He knows all the best words. He's way more humble than people realize. <laughs> Have you heard that interview, by the way? No, is that a recent one? I've been trying to stay away from the Trump coverage because of how prominent it's been. I just want to focus on the Olympics. It's reasonably recent. Um... He was doing an interview where uh, the interviewer said, You're not known to be a humble man, but I wonder. I think I am actually humble. I think I'm much more humble than you would understand. I'm so humble. I'm more humbler than that humble pie that your, that your stupid grandmother makes at the, at the bakes for the community bake sale. She got second place baking that In humble my pie. Day. She's a loser. I was first place with my humbleness. I'm a winner. In my day, there wasn't even a... I think about five holing like Ashley nearly did. Five holing meant something completely different. That was when I was very loose. <laughs> there weren't many jobs for women back then. Oh, great Aunt Sylvia. We learned way too much about you this week. 
Yeah, my favourite thing of the entire roadblock was just Amy's trainers with her costume. I own seven larders. Each larger than the, the last larder. It was my larger <laughs> larder collection. It was second greater than the larger larder. I was very good at math problems. So yeah, Rita and Yvette leave in second, with Frankie and Amy in third. Joel and Ashley... Rita Yvette killed that roadblock. She did. That was, that was amazing. Just the way she hushed the crowd as if she was going to drop some killer beats on them, but instead just dropped a killer speech. And uh, Jillian and Emmett leave in fifth, and for some reason tell Julian Lowell what the task is. Even though that's the only team left behind them in a scramble to stay alive. Yeah. And Julian Lowell leaving last, and teams must now find the Kingston Mills lock station, the pit stop for this leg of the race. The last team's check-in may be eliminated. It's only going to be a few years until uh, General Mills picks up the sponsor for this. This was a really, really bottom-of-the-barrel pit stop location. It's right, it's right on cannery levels. Yeah, because the fact of the matter is, I said this to Kurt when we were discussing the episode earlier, there are many locks around where I live. You can walk probably 20 minutes and find the canal and loads of these sort of locks. So this is a really quite pointless... Yeah pit stop location for me. Isn't that where Robin Hood was born? You know, the I, I assume so, because he's a Robin of Loxley. Close. So, Steph and Kristen check in first for the third time in a row. And they want to be the first all-female team to win. So, Michael, does that, can we conclude that an all-female team is going to win this season? Yep, and we can also conclude it will not be Steph and Kristen. Uh, and they win a trip for two to Rome, Italy. And they also get the wondrous pleasure of seeing John Montgomery throw an express pass off to the side. That's the real prize. Express pass Gonzo, no longer oh, usable. No. And it happened on Canadian soil because Canada. There's nothing more patriotic than throwing an express pass into the brush. When in Rome. Rome, Ontario. Yeah. Fly to Rome, Ontario! <laughs> you get breakfast in bed. And Rita and Yvette check in in second with Joel and Assy in third and then the, the NPC of the episode was Frankie Namie's um, directions giver who just waved to the camera randomly she was not quite as much as the as the woman in the thrift shop at the end of unfinished business keep on rolling fellas and uh, in a foot race Julian and Emmett checking in fourth with Frankie and Amy in fifth and Julian Lowell. Unintentional and biscuit reference on my part, by the way. Oh, good. And Julian Lowell in last. And um, next time. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. We went. We we glanced over that last little few scenes too fast. M my favorite part of the roadblock was Ashley with that enormous sized book for the speech because too many people were already at the roadblock. I did not notice that. You didn't notice that? It was no. the, the book the book to memorize the speech from was huge. Oh you need to you I needed this. <laughs> oh Yes, Tony Blachos from Survivor Kagayan. But I am. too many people were doing the roadblock at the same time, so Ashley had to memorize her speech outside and they and they give her an enormous book as if it was font size designed for lol. Oh, well, I don't know if the font size was huge, but the book certainly was. You have to go back and see that video. That's right when Ashley's starting to memorize the speech where it was just comical how big the book was. It's like, here, you get to have the master copy, Ashley, because too many people are occupying the other rooms. Or the fact that when they were performing it, that the, even Kingston sucks so bad that they even had to go inside to the parlor to do most of the roadblock. Yeah, because it was raining. In fact, Emmett even wiped some of the rain off, or some of the water off of the pit stop mat before checking in, as if he was worried about slipping off of it. By the way, Michael, have you ever seen Blackstone, Michael? Have you ever seen an episode of that? No. Neither have I. So, it's not Treadstone, though, so there's no uh, Matt Damon involved. There's no Jason Bourne. Matt Damon. We always gotta fit in an Adam and Alex reference somewhere. So, next time, teams fly to Havana in Cuba, and there are still beach volleyball, sugarcane, machetes, and an injury that threatens to take one team out of the race.
Which means it won't take them out of the race. Which means it will not take them out of the race. And also, we basically need a um, a non-elimination ne- like next week anyway. And what better way than Cuba? Yeah. And Cuba has a rich history in the international seasons. Between Israel's visit there and Australia's visit there, with a tragic elimination. And all sorts of ridiculousness. I can't wait. I Hopefully, the only embargo we see next week is an embargo on an elimination because if the season is 12 rounds, then we still got two more non-eliminations to go before the end of it. One fun fact about uh, Amazing Race Australia's first Cuban leg is it is one of the only legs ever to take place on three different continents. What? Yep. Teams started in Turkey, then headed to France, and then headed to Cuba, all in the same leg. That's the most awesome thing ever. Yeah. We actually got a proper old-school three-continent leg. So, is there anything else to add about this episode? Serenade Julian Lowell's exit, I guess? It's got to the point of the season where I'm really disappointed at every elimination. Mm -hmm. This is a contrast towards the conclusion of last season. Yeah, it's not got to Amazing Race Australia 2 levels of me being heartbroken at every elimination, but I'm disappointed at every elimination, so I'm disappointed Julian Lowell went. Can't say I'm surprised because they did have the worst average of the season, but they seem like very, very nice people, and the brief interactions that I've had with Julie especially, she seems very nice and very Mm -hmm. fun, and, and actually she laughed a lot at the banner last week when it was her puking in the plane. (laughs) <laughs> so they will be missed in the season but I can't say I'm surprised that they went out because we kind of we didn't have high hopes for them even though they didn't get to Bethany Hamilton level of obnoxious inspirational yeah I wish their edit was a bit better but it wasn't it wasn't bad yeah it wasn't like Bethany Hamilton bad where it's like eh, you can go home now so we can focus on other stuff more fun stuff I'm glad that they focused on the puns rather than lol being inspirational. Yeah. Actually, I, well, towards the end of it, it seemed like it was pretty even. And that they actually gave Julie airtime the past two weeks. I like that she wasn't completely invisible and wasn't entirely overshadowed by lol. Yeah, it, it's nice to see Julie and lol be awesome and actually only be eliminated because of a look task rather than anything they really did. And I will say, if it gets to the 2020 Paralympics and Lowell's there, I will be cheering him on. Oh my god, I just thought of something. That is the worst Olympics for a blind person to compete in. The 2020 Olympics? (laughs) Oh, Logan! (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, bike racing is no joke, so hats off to Lowell. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he, he was... He was uh, he was pretty awesome. Both are pretty awesome people, and I'm glad he got to go as far as he did. So, on that note, thank you for listening That's to the 2020 Olympics. <laughs> There's nothing better than people laughing at their own jokes, Logan. Um, <laughs> thank you for oh, listening. No, I just thought of it like just now, and just thinking like, man, I can't believe it. was that another editor's joke. I'm just thinking if the editors knew that, like. Oh, he's going to skip the 2016 Olympics and he's he's going to compete in the 2020 Olympics. Maybe that's why they put in his bio that it was going to be the Rio ones rather than the Tokyo ones. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this UR Team Number podcast. You can join us every Wednesday for more Amazing Race Canada recaps. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook page, Reality TV Warriors, on our own Twitter account, RTV Warriors, or our own Twitter pages, MJ Harmstone for me and Log Subwaki for Logan. See you next week. Peace out. Chill. Till the next episode. In Cuba. Godfather 2 references ahead? Who knows? Hashtag inaugurate. Yeah. Who do you take one for the Express Press? The girl. Uh, you can't confirm or deny. Yeah. Because we promised them we... I mean, somebody we... <laughs> <laughs>